We know that God is a God who restores. <clears throat> he can restore back to us that which has been lost, that which the enemy um, uh, has taken from us. He's a restorer of relationships. He's a restorer of things that are stolen, things that are lost. But more than that, he's a restorer of our health. So I'm not even talking about recovery of health this morning, even though I've had to walk through COVID myself uh, the last couple of weeks, and some of you have. I'm not even talking about recovery of health, although he is our healer. I, I want to talk about the recovery of our souls. I got a chance just briefly on Friday to share with that. We had, a, we had our entire school staff, our entire preschool staff uh, with us here on Friday for three hours. We got the chance to anoint them all with oil. Uh, and I got the chance to just share briefly about our souls. For the last couple of months, there's a, one little line of a verse that's been going over and over and over uh, in my head, and we're going to get to it uh, in a minute at the end. <clears throat> and so I'm constant. Even Friday, I shared with the, the, our staff here on Friday, on Thursday, I had everything lined up. This was to happen, that was to happen, this was to happen, this was to take place. And by the middle of the day, none of that was working. None of it. And I was starting to get angry at this, angry at that. <clears throat> I'm sitting at my desk and I look up at my computer screen with my message sitting on it. And the question was, Warren, how is your soul? How is your soul? Our souls are the real us. And if we're not careful or observant, we will, we will fix everything else up in our life. We'll go after this and we'll go after that and not aware that our souls need refreshing, they need restoring, they need recovery. How is your soul? Our soul includes our thinking, our living being, our selves, our minds, our personality, our inner desires, our inner feelings. Our English version of soul usually just describes only the inner person and it contrasts it with the outer person. But in the Hebrew, the soul describes the whole person that is our lives as living creations. How is your soul? You would know Psalm 23, and in Psalm 23, I think it's the second or third verse, David, who was a shepherd, but knew he needed a shepherd, said, he, Jesus the shepherd, he restores my soul. The word there for restores means to turn around or bring back to. It means to return. It means to change. It means to recover. We all probably can say that verse off by heart, even say it backwards. He restores my soul. And I kept looking at it because other than the fact that we know David as a shepherd boy, he fought lions and bears, and none of us afford any uh, lions and bears. But I'm trying to compare David's life as a shepherd boy sitting out there looking after sheep and our life full of our anxiety, full of our stress, full of our busyness, full of everything that's on our plate. And I'm trying to go, why would David need his soul restored? We have an invitation from Jesus himself to bring to Jesus our souls, for he is the restorer and recovery, cut recover of our souls. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus stands with an invitation. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. It is a picture of those who have never followed Jesus, never accepted Jesus. And if you're watching today, you're here in the room, there's an invitation for you to find salvation, to find Jesus Christ, to, to, to find new life in his death and resurrection. So there's an invitation to those who have never, ever said yes to Jesus. But it's an invitation to us who are following him. And so as I read that verse, Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary and carry heavy 
heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Immediately we think about that's for someone else. We think about people, maybe friends, family in our church. Oh, yeah, they're going through it tough. That's for them. And we fail to see that Jesus said, come unto me all. He's talking about the, emo- the, emo- the emotional things that we carry, the physical things. We become spiritually tired. There's things that weigh us down. Only Jesus can bring spiritual refreshment and restoration to our souls. He said in Matthew 16, which is a couple of cha- chapters later, he says to the to people around him, he says, you know what, that you can gain the whole world and at the same time lose your own soul, your very life of existence. Now, we would speak that to people who are not followers, and it's true. You, if you're not following Jesus today, you can gain everything this world has and yet lose your own soul and, and spend eternity without it. But Jesus is not talking to people who don't know him. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to his followers, and he says to them, this is a daily commitment. If you want to run your own life, you be in control of your own life. But you can gain everything there is. This is his followers. He, he says, if you want to be my follower, you've got to deny. If you want to, if you, you can gain everything this world has to offer. You can gain title. You can gain fame. You could, and yet you can lose your own soul. Our souls are so important that because we at times follow our own agendas. We have our, 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 you you probably have your agenda already marked out for today, this week, this year. That's great. But sometimes we follow after our own agenda instead of following his agenda for my life. I I read this uh, a couple of weeks ago from Charles Spurgeon who was was a famous preacher. He says, consider how precious a soul must be, your soul must be, when both God and the devil are after it. When things don't go our way, we're not as planned, when all our ducks don't line up in a row and all our prayers don't get answered and this doesn't happen and that doesn't happen, what is the condition of our souls as we go through this year? How is your soul? And Jesus gives us an invitation to those following him and to those who are not following him. Come to me, come to me and find rest for your souls. Have you already done it this week, this year? Because we're already now already a month into it. And we've just rolled from one year into another and we take care of everything else in our life. And sometimes forget how is your soul? If you're, like, if you're like me, we're hurried from one thing to another. We never take time out to stop or refresh or recover or slow down. David said, he restores my soul, but not when we're going 100 miles an hour. I picture David would have been sitting there on the hill, maybe in the evening. We want, we want God to restore us, but we've got to keep going at 100 miles an hour. When the disciples were following Jesus, they didn't have cars, trams, buses, Ubers. They didn't run with him. They walked with him. I struggled to walk slow. I have to stop myself when Judith and I are out walking. I have to stop. <laughs> Judith comes along and then we start off it. And then I have to, I struggled to walk slow. That's my problem, not hers. As I was writing this, I remember an old hymn. I remember my father singing it. He says, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He walks with us. And then I read this quote by this guy, I don't know who he is from Barso, except that his quote jumped out at me. He says, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Walter Adams. I don't know if we take time sometimes just to stop and walk with an unhurried pace because we're going, going. David says, he restores my soul. You would think 
and I haven't even got everything named here, so you might be able to think of a few things to add. You would think with all the things we have that do everything for us, right, okay? All the things we have that 20, 30 years ago our parents wouldn't have had, all the things we have that do everything for us. Google, internet, emails, our smartphones, our smart watches, our Robovax, Siri, banking online, program, 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 thank you, machines. You would think with all these things that are doing everything for us, that we would have enough time to stop and our souls would be rested as we don't have to do anything. And yet, if anything, our souls need recovering more than ever. Pastor, Book, uh, Pastor Beck, before we went away, blessed Judith and I with some books to read while on the plane. Well, it never happened going over. And I, I had this, I'll get to this verse in a minute. I got this verse in the back of my head and mind going. And finally, just about a day or two before we left and all on the plane, I opened up the book. So I'm not preaching from the book. The book was just actually speaking to me what Scripture was already saying to me, what the Holy Spirit was already saying to me, and what was going through my head. I just needed another reminder. I haven't got the book here. It's on my desk. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It, may, it says how to, how to stay emotionally healthy and spiritually alive in the chaos of the modern world. It's written by John Mark Comer. I shared this on Friday. He quotes from a study, research done by Julia Nathan from Business Insider. It's a magazine in America on July 13, 2016. So we're already nearly six years from when this study was done. And she did a study, and it's, as I said Friday, they said the average iPhone user, and so if you use Samsung this morning, you're probably excluded, but... And you can believe this or not, the study's been done, I'll give you the reference, you can go look at it. The average iPhone user, and you can add your watch into that, touches or looks at his or her phone 2,167 times a day and night. In his book he says the distraction or he uses the word addiction, I love that, because if we were talking about addiction, it's always somebody else. You've got drugs, alcohol, this, that, anger. Church, we're addicted to our phones because they're on 24-7. Our whole life is governed by it. My life is governed by it. He says, the distraction or the addiction and the pace of our lives, what is it doing to the life of our souls? You know what, because I can get more obsessed with the condition of my phone if it's not working or is working or whether I have no internet than I am about the condition of my soul. I can live in my daily life in all the distractions, in all the busyness, and some of it's legitimate. We live a busy life. And forget and not even be aware that he, God, the creator of the universe, our father, our shepherd, our God, is with us and for us, and he thinks about us and delights in us, and the invitation for us is to come to him. To find refreshing for our souls and recovery for our souls. The invitation to come and follow him as disciples. When Jesus said that his disciples, if you want to follow me, you want to become my disciples, he gives them. He didn't say, come to me and be a better Christian, be a better person, be a better church attender. No, he said, come follow me and be my disciple, be my follower. In Psalm 63, David's king. It's ironical where we're sitting here today in the heat and where David was in Psalm 63. He's in the wilderness of Judea. He's hiding from his son Absalom, 
who's rebelled against him. It says he's in the wilderness. It's hot. It's dry. He has no water. Obviously, he has no air conditioning, and he's isolated. And it causes David to reflect and call out to God. In the barrenness, he's hot, dry. He's running for his life. It's wilderness, no water. He considers not how much he longs for physical water, although he does. David considers his thirst the thirst of his soul. He says here, oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. David would go on to say that your love for me, your mercy for me is better than life itself. And then he, he, he's, I picture it, he's in the middle of the wilderness. He's being pursued. It's hot. It's dry. He's thirsty. And in the middle of it, David is so overwhelmed with God's faithfulness. In the desert, in the fling, in the hunt, he's so overwhelmed, not with fear, but with God's love that he cannot but not praise him. And David says, I will bless you. I will lift my hands in your name. It's the last thing I feel like doing when I'm sitting in front of my computer and nothing else is going right and it's hot and dry and I'm thirsty. The last thing, oh, you know what? Forget all that. I'm just going to bless you. David says, I will lift up my hands in your name. It's a picture of surrender. It's a picture of giving worth to God. It's a picture of saying, I can't do this and you are worthy of all praise. Listen. The fresh recovery of his soul to David and thirsting for God was enough to sustain him in his own wilderness. I'll say it again, because David didn't have anyone he could ring. He wasn't in a coffee group. He had no one else he could contact. Him. There wasn't even a meeting place he could get to. He's all out there by himself. But the fresh recovery of his soul and thirsting for God and praising God was enough to sustain him in his own wilderness. We come to him, we're thirsty for him, we draw to him. Remember, Jesus didn't just call us to be Christians. The word Christian is only mentioned three times in the New Testament, but to be his followers. Jesus said in John 10, 27, you, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. You can, argue with, you can argue theologically with me later on these next couple of things I'm going to say, but I'm going to say them anyhow because I'm looking at my own life. I don't believe you can be a follower, a disciple, and not be a Christian or someone who's just, my whole being longs for you. But I can be a Christian or maybe a church attender and not necessarily be following him. Jesus said, they listen to my voice. They're in relationship with me. David goes on to say, in the middle, he's out in the wilderness, remember? He's desert, hot. David goes, I think on you. I lay in my bed at the end of a day with no fan above it, and I think about you in the darkness of the night. Like, if you're like me, we think about the troubles of the day and the days to come. We get consumed by them. And then David makes this beautiful statement. You have been my help. You are my helper. And because you have been my help, I will praise you with everything else happening. And then there comes this one line. Well, well you would know. We used to sing this song in the 70s. So if you were around then, and it's funny how, it's funny how that, when we put music to Scripture, it's easier for us to remember because I have sung this line over and over again. I'm going to give it to you in about five different versions. Remember, David's in the wilderness. It's hot. It's dry. He's thirsty. What he really needs is physical water, but what he really wants more than it is to thirst for God. He stole thirst for him. And so David says this in the New King James Version. My soul follows close behind you. 
your right hand upholds me. The NLT says, I will follow close behind, me, behind you. Your right hand holds me securely. The NASB says, my soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me. The Passion Translation says, with passion I pursue and cling to you because I feel your grip on my life. I keep my soul close to your heart. This is the version I love because this is how we used to sing it. So when I typed it in, the dictionary refused to accept it. I had to overwrite it. It says, my soul followeth hard after you. Your right hand upholds me. Can you get that picture? David says, my soul doesn't even just follow you. My soul follows hard after you. The song says, I won't sing it, but it says, my soul followeth hard after you. Early in the morning will I rise up and seek you. And because you have been my help in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. I will rejoice. In the wilderness, thirsty, being pursued, what is the main thing that's consuming David? His soul. His living being, his very self, his breathing, his desires, his appetite, emotion, everything that belongs to it. It's interesting because I don't know if it's linked together or whether the, the, the translators have, have separated them, but the word for follow and the word for, the word for follow and the word for close are exactly the same word. It's like a double close, like a double follow. It means to cling to, cleave to, keep close. We were created to follow him. Today you can do that for the first time. You can surrender your life. But I wonder if in 2022, forget about 2020, 2021, forget, put them behind you. In 2022, can we make a decision that we will encourage one another to follow him? The whole. Can we make a decision to encourage one another to follow hard after him with all our souls? over every other conversation that we may have, if we could help each other in the health of our souls and following Jesus, could you imagine the difference it would make? Encourage someone with all you have, your soul following hard after Jesus, your shepherd, over everything else for 2022. We don't know what tomorrow holds. What we do know is that Jesus our maker, and Jesus, the lover of our souls. We sometimes find it hard to love our souls, but Jesus is the lover of our souls. And he calls us, he stands and waits for us to bring our souls to him, to recover our souls and to find rest for our souls. How do I do that? It begins with one step. I just step away from the things that do not replenish or restore my soul and I listen to his voice and I come to him. I hear Jesus calling. Maybe you don't know him, but Jesus is calling you. Maybe you're dry, he's calling you. Maybe you're thirsty, he's calling you. Maybe you're in the deep and you're in way over your head, he's calling you. Or maybe you're at the edge where the waves are just crashing over you, he's calling you. In the wilderness, or whether you're afraid, or whether you're fearful, he's calling you. I take one step to him. You may say, you don't know where I am. You don't know what's happening. You can't see the chaos in my world, the disaster in my world. I, because I was supposed to speak this a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you started the year off reading from Genesis 1, but I read about a God who created the world and he created life from void, darkness, and chaos. And if he can do it with creation, he can do it with our lives. Situations we're in that we face that seem impossible, we can come to him we can bring our souls to him, the whole being. Some of you are like pictures, some of you are like trees in the wind of the storm. You've been bent, maybe out of shape, but the winds and the storms that may have bent you, but you're not broken. And we come to the maker and reminder of 
our souls if the worship team would come this morning. In Lamentations, there's a little book written by the prophet Jeremiah. He's lamenting because of everything that's happening around about him. He's lost hope with everything that was going on. He says, my soul sinks within me. And then I recall to mind who you are. I recall to mind that your mercies, your compassion, your love are new every morning. You are a faithful God. And then he does something. He speaks to himself. And he speaks to himself. He says, therefore, I say, you are my portion, says my soul. You are my God. I put my hope in you. He recalls to mind and then he speaks to himself. It's a good thing to go through this year. To restore your soul is to speak out loud what he's saying to you. I'm doing a devotion at the moment for 21 days where we're to read the devotion aloud. And then we're to read all the scriptures, and there's a lot. And we're to read them aloud to ourselves. And then we're to pray out loud. There's something about speaking to yourself. He is my portion. You know, Jesus asked us to come to him to recover our souls. Because when our souls are out of whack, we lose sight of who he is. Who we are, and the main thing we lose sight of the harvest that's around about us. John Comer, in the book I mentioned to you, he he, he sums up one of the chapters with this. The whole point, I think it's on your screen, the whole point of discipleship or being a follower is to model all of your life after Jesus and in so doing to recover your soul, to have the warped part of you put back into shape to experience healing in the deepest parts of your being to experience what Jesus called life, life to the full. Jesus calls us today to to come to him. I had my car serviced last Monday. It was way over the 10,000 kilometers it should have been serviced in. They hand me back the car And it's now good for another 10,000. And at times we run our lives like that. Or wait another 10,000, whatever it is before. Oh, I need a fresh. When Jesus calls to us to come to him daily, he's calling for us to come daily to him. He calls us to be with him. He calls us to become like him. So we're reflecting who he is to the people in our world. And he calls us to do what he asks us to do. My soul followeth hard after you. All of us get off track at some times. We take a wrong turn, we take the wrong ramp. It happened to us a couple of times when we were driving. Judah said it's exit four, I said, no, it's exit five. And guess what? We had to go all the way around. We get off track. We take the wrong turn. We take the wrong ramp. But the invitation is still there. He doesn't stand there with a big stick. He doesn't stand in judgment. The invitation is from one invitee to another, come to me and find rest for your souls. And so we begin again because we remember his words. He restores our soul. And guess what? And I say yes. What about you? Every time you look at your phone this week, your wristwatch, can you remind yourself, ask yourself the question, how is my soul? Because we're supposed to be reaching a world outside the four walls here. And we're not going to reach them if our soul's in it. He asks us to come to him. I'm going to ask Beck to come and just close this morning. And Father, we come to you this morning. You call us to be with you, to become like you, to do as you ask us to do. And I don't even know what the response is we're to make today, Lord, but you're asking us, you, the one who goes before us, 
the one who's with us, beside us. You're asking us to come to you because you are all we need. You're asking us to come to you because you are our everything. To not even out of a religious way, but we just acknowledge that to go through this year, we need our souls restored, refreshed, recovered. We don't want to be giving out our anger, our frustration, our thinking, our attitudes. We want to be like reflectors on a bicycle. We want to be reflecting the one we're following. So Lord, this morning, even in this silence, we just bring you our souls afresh. And Holy Spirit, help us and show us what's to be our response as we walk daily following Jesus. In Jesus' name.